Academy Awards may have come and gone, but we're not going to let them slip past unreviewed. Coming up in this Golden Statuette Fields episode, we have a recap of this year's ceremonies from Nicole Kane, an evaluation of host Ellen DeGeneres' handling of the night, a look at some of the more unsung categories with Ben Kramer, and much, much more. So put on your top hat, white tie, and tails, because the Real Deal Oscar special starts now. And welcome to The Real Deal, Ball State's one and only entertainment news show. I'm Kaylee Russell. And I'm Connor Fack. This past Sunday, the who's who of Hollywood once again gathered in Los Angeles for their annual evening of glitz and glamour. You're looking pretty glitzy yourself, Kaylee. Thanks, as are you, Connor. The 86th Annual Academy Awards, presented by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, saluted both those in front of and behind the camera as they carried on the torch of making wonderful films for the silver screen. Unfortunately, The Real Deal was not invited out to cover the show in California. Have no fear, though, because we have Nicole Kane on hand to recap one of the most highly watched Oscars in a decade. What were the big moments, Nicole? The 86th annual Oscars were held this past Sunday at Hollywood's Dobie Theater. Per usual, it was a star-studded event. The biggest question of the night were who will win Best Supporting Actors and what film will win Best Picture. The first award presented that night was Best Actor in Supporting Role, which was won by Jared Leto for his emotionally moving performance in Dallas Fires Club. The next award presented was Achievement in Costume Design, and it was taken home by The Great Gatsby, which was also honored with Achievement in Production Design. I, like the majority of the population, loved that The Great Gatsby won both the Oscars that it was nominated for. Next up in the show was one film that won an astounding seven awards in visual effects, film editing, original score, sound mixing, sound editing, cinematography, and best directing. And it was none other than Gravity. Now, with Gravity winning such a large portion of the awards, there were some upsets about those outcomes. However, with every award show, there are upsets, but there are also magnificent triumphs. One of the best triumphs of the night was when Lupita Nyong'o won best supporting Best Actress in a Supporting Role for her work in 12 Years a Slave. I know that everyone at the Rio Deal couldn't be more excited for her first Oscar win, and none of us would be shocked to see her nominated in the future. Onto the fun and childlike side of the Oscars, the category for Best Animated Picture was an extremely competitive group this year, including Despicable Me Too and Disney's newest film, Frozen. Now, I personally love both of these films and was not shocked when Frozen won the Oscar. What really made this particular Academy Awards special was that this year, as an audience, we were able to experience one of the most competitive groups for Best Picture, leaving us all wondering who could possibly win. With this being the last award of the night, we painfully waited through the entire program just to see who would take home the Oscar. And the winner of the 2014 Academy Award for Best Picture was 12 Years a Slave, directed by Stephen McQueen. With a stellar cast and emotionally gripping storyline, this picture transports you back to that time period. Personally, I thought it was a well-deserved win, and I can't wait to see what next year brings. This has been Nicole Kane with your Oscar recap. Thank you, Nicole. It was certainly a great night. And as one of the more anticipated awards shows of each year, we knew that lots of folks around the campus of Ball State would be watching the Academy Awards as well. Here's field correspondent Nick Ewing with what you had to say about the Oscars. Take it away, Nick. Hey guys, Nick Ewing here with The Real Deal. Uh, now the Oscars have come and gone again, we decided to go to campus and talk to you guys to see what your opinions were on this year's award show. Honestly, when it comes to the Oscars, I think Ellen did amazing. I really like that Ellen hosted it. Um, she always normally does a good job with, with hosting things. Um, she asked if we wanted pizza and everybody clapped and then a couple minutes later she gave out pizza and that was awesome. The big thing I think with Ellen, she has a lot of respect for the actors and a lot of the actors have respect for her. I think she's hilarious. I think she, you know, went down the line pretty well of, you know, being funny and not offending too much, but still like coming close enough. So she's one of the few people, few comedians that can come up there, crack jokes and uh, get away with a lot of different things. So that was a big reason why I thought she did a great job. I actually watched a lot of the films that were nominated for Academy Awards, and 12 Years a Slave of all the films to me was the most deserving. Um, but, I mean, I agreed with 12 Years a Slave winning Best Picture. And uh, 12 Years a Slave definitely deserved Best Picture. 
uh, mainly because of the emotional impact it left with you, the great acting performances. And Lupita Nyong'o definitely deserved Best Supporting Actress. I can't wait to think of one actor or actress who was in that film who's not deserving of Best Actor or Best Actress. Um, I was rooting for Dallas Buyers Club, um, but uh, Jared Leto and uh, Matthew McConaughey did both win, so I was happy about that. I thought Matthew McConaughey deserved it. Matthew McConaughey has definitely changed a lot as an actor over the course of the past few years. Matthew McConaughey he starved himself for this role. He worked really hard, it was for a good cause, and it was about a good like topic, a subject. And then winning in Dallas Buyers Club has really, uh, I think, shown that he is a very dynamic actor, can do a lot of different things, and I think we'll see him do a lot more serious roles moving forward. Well, there you have it. I think it's safe to say that everyone thought the award show was great this year. Ellen did a good job hosting, the movies were fantastic, and all the actors and actresses did a wonderful job. I don't know about you guys, but I'm already looking forward to next year's Oscars. I'm Nick Ewing, back to you guys. Thanks for the reporting, Nick. We're always glad to get those real, real deal opinions. And we're always glad that you're watching. So don't go anywhere as we head into our first break. Ahead, we've got Ramel to die reviewing Ellen's hosting, Chauncey Baker being rebuilt bewildered, Kelly Figley giving us the scoop on this year's Best Director, and more. We better get it back. You sure this works? No, but I am sure that if you don't try this drug, you'll be dead in three days. You said there'd be one guy. Not five. I only work in black, and sometimes very, very dark gray. Save it. Welcome back. Of course, one of the forces that helped this year's Oscars sail safely through the storm of potential mishaps and gaffes was the woman at the helm of the voyage, the easy breezy Ellen DeGeneres. And the sailing analogy works especially well since she first came out in a pirate shirt. To tell us just how Pirate Ellen stole both our hearts in the show, here's Ramel to die with the Oscar host spotlight. Ramel? Going down in history as the first Oscars host to interactively live tweet during the ceremony, second timer Ellen DeGeneres acted as if she were among friends inside the Dolby Theater on Sunday night. Compared to last year's interesting alternative choice of Seth MacFarlane, Ellen joined the likes of Billy Crystal and Johnny Carson with a classic template of staging wholesome antics ranging from lottery scratch card consolation prizes to intentional costume changes. Starting off the night with a traditional opening monologue, Ellen landed her crude joke sweetly while playing homage to key members of the audience such as Liza Minnelli as well as a few of the night's nominees. As many of her best material was dealt directly with the in-house audience, Ellen was a natural at keeping everyone, including the viewers at home, awake throughout the telecast. One of my favorite bits of the night was basically Ellen's degenerous pizza extravaganza, pizza. where so she ordered three do, boxes of LA-based like Mama's and Papa, pizza Papa's Pizzeria of Pizzas so and handed slices amongst the starlets. Unlike the Golden Globes, the Oscars have a, no, a strict no-food policy, even at the expense of starving guests after a long transition from the red carpet to showtime. And with that, Ellen successfully handed out all the slices of pizzas to the first few rows and returned shortly after a commercial break to collect tips for the pizza guy. Though I was expecting her to dance her way onto stage, a la her talk show, and clean up some of the awkwardly funny transitions, Ellen DeGeneres was able to capture the same magic Billy brought during his hosting days and the lovable charm that came with it. Academy, do your part and give the people what they want. Invite Ellen back for years to come. Thanks, Ramel. I know I would not mind that one bit. Nor would I. In fact, I wouldn't mind if the show always went as smoothly as this year. But even with such a smooth show, our resident crab apple Chauncey Baker has still found something to rant about. What's up this time, Chauncey? Ah, Oscar season. 
just another thing for me to complain about. Where do I begin? In all honesty, this year was a comedic gold mine. While watching with friends, they were tuning into the E-Red Carpet coverage. Now, I'm not a fashion expert. Heck, I can hardly dress myself as it is. Matching socks is actually quite difficult. However, I will say it doesn't take an expert to know that Jennifer Lawrence looked hot in well, whatever she was wearing. At the bottom of the screen, there were warnings in big giant letters saying, Fashion alert! Christoph Waltz is wearing a tuxedo by some fancy French dude. We know. You might as well tell us that they're just Baby wearing clothing. Tell me about I really could care less, but since I'm not even a fashion guy, I guess I can't talk. Yeah, yet, but, but I will anyway. On a turn left down Bizarre Avenue, they also had the Pedicam. Literally, they had actresses put their hands down on a sheep of carpet and a mini camera. They walked down it. It was just beyond weird for me. What next? I, I really can't even think of a witty comeback to that. I'm just so perplexed by it. And of course, Jennifer Lawrence fell down once again. Is it intentional? You be the judge. Oh, and Harrison Ford was basically IMDB with the way he was describing the Best Picture nominees. I mean, who needs the internet when you have Harrison Ford to tell you? He kind of looked like Colonel Sanders. But hey, he was Han Solo, so I guess he can gay with, get away with, you know, whatever he wants to. The biggest intro complaint I have is John Travolta's bombing of the pronunciation of Adina Menzel's name right before she was supposed to perform that one song from Frozen. I think I'm the one person in America who hasn't illegally watched that film yet. Anyway, John Travolta's hairpiece, I mean, his pronunciation of Adina's name, sounded something like Adele Dazim. The wickedly talented one and only Adele Dazim. Wait, what is that? Of course, the internet soon took this by storm, and there is now an official Adele Dazim fan page. Pure comedic gold. Adele. Oh dear, that's no good. Dazim. Wow, you really don't know anything. Almost as funny as when he mispronounced Les Mis during last year's ceremony. Les Miserables. Oh. Attention Academy, give Vinny Barbarino easy words to say. Anyway, I'm Chauncey Bake here. Real does fashion consult, I mean, this has been the rant. Adele Dazim. I'm your number one fan. Thanks, Chauncey. Now I'm just imagining Harrison Ford serving me a bucket of chicken. And I would accept said chicken immediately. Well, just in case you've got any A-listers trying to offer you some fried food, we're going to go ahead and take our second break. But we'll be back soon after with Ben Kramer flying under the radar to examine the documentary feature category. Kelly Figley shining the director's spotlight on big winner Alfonso Cuaron, and more all after this. Glad you stuck around. Sometimes it's easy to forget that the power of cinema can be used not just to help the masses escape from their everyday lives, but also to illuminate and bring attention to real tragedy and conflict around the world. The Academy knows this well, and each year honors some of the most impressive and relevant documentary films created within the last year. With a look into this important yet unsung category, here's Ben Kramer with Under the Radar. Ben? The best documentary feature category is often overlooked when it comes to the general movie population and even to some of the hardcore film buffs. As an Oscar aficionado, I too am pretty ignorant when it comes to the nominees for any given year. Th and this year was no exception. The five nominees were The Act of Killing, Cutie and the Boxer, Dirty Wars, The Square, and the winner of Sunday Night, 20 Feet from Stardom. I admit, I read articles to try and predict the winner because I don't particularly like watching documentaries. However, I do consider documentaries to be the most important genre in cinema simply because of its potential impact and significance to not only our society, but other countries as well. Most Oscar-nominated documentaries try to tackle a subject with substance. The filmmakers make it a goal to capture a sequence of events that deal with something worth showing a wide audience. And these kinds of filmmakers spend plenty of years, not to mention an abundance of resources, to try and assemble a film that will pull in an audience. The five nominees for this year's Oscars were no exception. But to keep it short, I'm going to take a look at just the three most popular. The Oscars website has a brief synopsis of each nominee, and here's the one for the act of killing. In the wake of the deaths of nearly a million opponents of Indonesia's political regime, the heads of the country's death squads are celebrated as heroes. Challenged to examine their actions by creating films about the killings, the men produce elaborately staged movies that reenact the mass slayings. I honestly thought this one would win, as it was getting reviews that said it was the most compelling documentary ever. The other popular nominee was Cutie and the Boxer. It was about the 40-year marriage of painter Ushio Shinohara 
known for his boxing paintings, and his wife, Noriko, who gave up her own career as an artist to focus on her husband. They became the subject of a series of comic strips drawn by Noriko. As the 80-year-old Ushio finds his own artistic reputation fading, Noriko's fame continues to grow. Never did I think 20 Feet from Stardom would win this competitive category. This winner dealt with background singers heard on many of the 20th century's greatest songs. It takes us center stage for an in-depth look at their role as supporting figures in the complex process involved in creating the finished recordings. Once I heard the amazing acceptance speech slash song from Darlene Love, I was ready to admit that I was proven wrong by this decision. Whereas most winners in the past deal with controversial subjects, films like 20 Feet from Stardom are proof that inspiring subjects with an underdog perspective can get the golden statue too. I think it's fitting that the film was about singers who were always under the radar. I'm Ben Kramer and this has been Under the Radar. Back to you. Thanks, Ben. As somewhat of a singer myself, I may have to give 20 Feet from Freedom a look. You know, the subject of our next segment got pretty close to some stars, too. Just, well, the real ones. Ah, yes. Here to explore the career of the out-of-this-world Alfonso Cuaron is Kelly Figley with the Director Spotlight. Kelly? I don't think anyone was surprised on Sunday when the Oscar for Best Directing went to Alfonso Cuaron for his space drama Gravity. In addition to that honor, he also picked up the award for Best Editing. He and his son Jonas co-wrote the screenplay for this film and have gotten to experience its success together. These awards mark, mark Cuaron's first Oscar wins of his career. Cuaron has been nominated for a total of six Academy Awards and is the first Latin American to win Best Director. But it seems that not that many people know very much about today's most talked about director, so we thought we'd give a little background. Coron was born in Mexico City in 1961 and has been a movie fanatic from a very young age. He got his start making short films and signed with Warner Brothers in 1995 to direct a film adaptation of the book A Little Princess. After that, he went on to film Great Expectations, the 1998 movie adaptation of the Charles Dickens novel, which starred Gwyneth Paltrow and Ethan Hawke. He then returned to Mexico to film Y Tu Mama Tambien, a movie that earned him his first Oscar nomination for Best Original Screenplay. Because of that success, Cuaron was asked to direct the movie that most people would recognize his name from, the third installment of the Harry Potter series, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. The film received both critical and popular su success. Next, he gained two more Academy Award nominations for his dystopian science fiction film, Children of Men, which starred Clive Owen and Julianne Moore. His film Gravity took home seven of the ten Academy Awards it was nominated for, dominating the technical and visual effects awards and raking in the most trophies out of all the films nominated. Cuaron is currently working with J.J. Abrams on the new NBC series Believe about a young girl with special powers. It is set to premiere next Monday at 10 p.m. A talented man to be sure. Thanks for the report, Kelly. Now, we're nearly done with our Gold Gilded episode, but don't tune out just yet. Kaylee and I still have to give our final word right after this. The most amazing dog in history is taking family time. Sherman? I'm good. To a whole new dimension. It seems we've ripped a hole in the space-time continuum. Looks like the past is coming to us. Mr. Peabody and Sherman. This really was one of the more enjoyable Oscars in a long time. The theme of heroes or something like that was a bit vague and random when it appeared, but otherwise it was a very solid show. I agree. There were no big hiccups, no jokes that went too far, and no real dead time, which is quite the feat for a three-and-a-half-hour program. Mm-hmm. To wrap up our program, then, we thought we'd not only recount our favorite personal moments from the ceremony, 
but also speculate who could possibly fill Ellen's shoes if, God forbid, she turns out to be unavailable for next year. Oscar hosting is, after all, a hard gig. It's a tough pick to find someone who's both well-known and likable enough to seem valid being there, but also isn't actually nominated for anything. Only brave souls need apply. This is the final word. Well, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Robert Downey Jr. deserves to be an Oscar host. He did not present this year, presumably because, for once, he didn't have to promote an Iron Man or Sherlock movie. Also, I think he's filming the Avengers sequel right now, if IMDb is correct, so maybe that's another reason why he was a no-show at this year's Oscars. So yeah, Downey Jr. is a busy guy. Still, I think he would be perfect as a host. Each year that Robert Downey Jr. has presented, he's been hilarious and charismatic and just all around sassy. And if RDJ isn't enough, give us Jude Law as well. That pair was born to host the Oscars. In fact, there are rumors that a third Sherlock Holmes movie is in the works, so the timing for next year couldn't be more perfect. Moving on, my favorite moment of Sunday night was when Ellen reportedly broke Twitter after her selfie with 10 stars went viral. She made history by being the first Twitter user to get 1 million retweets for a single post. Of course, the selfie itself was fantastic, with Meryl Streep, Kevin Spacey, Lupita Nyong'o and her brother Peter, Bradley Cooper, Jennifer Lawrence, Brangelina, and more getting together for this picture. However, the most amazing thing is that we are living in an age where social media dictates everything, even award shows. We now live in an age where live tweeting the Academy Awards, or any show for that matter, is the norm, and those that don't are considered, quote, uncool. Maybe this isn't impressive to anyone else, but the journalism student in me thinks that this is awesome. When Ellen shuts down Twitter from a star-studded selfie, the world becomes a little bit smaller. Thanks, Kaylee. I'm glad I was sitting with the cool kids to watch the awards. <laughs> Alas, most of the people I'd really like to see host are dead. Groucho Marx, Dean Martin, Danny Kaye, they're all greats, but sadly unavailable. And if they're not dead, then they're British, which unfortunately just wouldn't do. Sorry, Stephen Fry. I obviously can't host myself because likable, yeah, well-known, try me in 20 years. But this is tough. If I had to choose any newcomer to host who had never done it before, however, I think I'd pick either Steve Carell or Elijah Wood. They're both certainly well-known and likable enough, and either one is probably multi-talented enough to do a competent song and dance number. Wood probably looks better in a slim suit, but Carell, I feel, has that sort of affable chumminess that would allow him to pal around with all the big stars. He'd most likely be better at keeping the viewers laughing, too. As far as my favorite moment, I just have to go back to Ellen with the pizzas. It was quirky, unexpected, and somehow satisfying to see stars trying to avoid getting $3 greasy pizza on their $3,000 outfits. When she first brought it up somewhat randomly before introducing the next presenter, I personally tweeted, Ellen, queen of the non sequiturs, who wants pizza? Well, here's Bradley Cooper. I honestly shot, thought she was just being totally random. I did not expect her to show up an hour later with a delivery boy in tow to start doling out slices. Incidentally, that guy was a real delivery boy from a local pizza chain who had no idea he was going to appear on camera. Ellen had him on her talk show the very next day to give him his thousand dollar tip. And while the whole detour was completely unmovie related, I did think it prompted what I thought was the single funniest tweet of the night. It's not delivery, it's degenerous. And that wraps up our show for the week. Be sure to check out our Facebook and Twitter pages, as well as our website at www.realdealbsu.com for updates on all things entertainment. I'm Kaylee Russell. And I'm Connor Fack. We'll see you next time.